For 200 years, Singapore has been home to the Jews, the Parsis. Wherever the Parsis have gone, they have brought sweetness to that country. Beautiful. The Arabs. Next generation of the Aljunet family. Beautiful. And the Armenians. Galveston Avenue is named after my Armenian grand uncle. They are part of the Singapore mosaic today, and this is their story. For Project Glamway, um, I'm pretty excited to show how the Arabic garment can be styled in various ways and can be worn by people of all walks of life. I want to share the Arab garments can be worn not just by the Muslim, it can be worn by Chinese, by the Angmos, whoever. Even more excited because uh, my daughters very very eager to be involved, walking the runway as well. Thank you very much, Thank you Lulu very much. Al Haddad. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lulu Al Haddad. I'm a third generation Singaporean Arab and very proud to be one. I'm a local fashion designer here in Singapore, mainly designing Middle Eastern uh, inspired garments like the kaftan. Most of all, it's like a modern fusion feel to all my designs. Lulu carries two fashion lines, a range of everyday Middle Eastern kaftans as well as bridal wear. And in each line, she has interwoven her Arabic heritage in the designs. For me, it's very important because it's from where I came from. It's my roots. The Arab uh, culture has always been very strong in my family strongly inculcated by my parents and I want to share with everyone what I love which is uh, the Middle Eastern cultures which is not just um, fashion but to share the colours, the work, the details like the embroidery designs. I'm probably the only Middle Eastern inspired fashion designer here in Singapore so yeah that's why it's important for me to share my culture. And fans of her signature designs are not just from Singapore and the region, but as far away as Australia, the Middle East and the US. So I'm going to show you uh, three different kinds of the main Arabic bridal dresses. So the first one we have is the Hadrami style, which is basically a kaftan cut uh, bridal wear. It has no sleeves, so it's like just draped down and then it comes with the traditional uh, gold headgear, okay? So the second one we have is the Moroccan style, okay? So it's a three-piece. You have the inner dress, the jacket and the belt. So the belt is the focus of all Moroccan bridal wear and it comes with the matching bridal veil as well. So lastly, we have is the fusion style. For this style, particular style, I mixed a Indian brocade with um, velvet here to show the Arabic element with the embroidery and she's wearing a traditional uh, face veil. I carry um, fusion bridal gown styles because now brides are more modern. Some of them, they do not want to wear too traditional. Over the past hundred years, we have also evolved in fashion, in our cultures, so now it's mixed more to a modern style. The adoption and blending in of new cultures is not new to the Arabs. In the 18th century, when they first arrived in Singapore, the Arabs assimilated into the local community and adopted their cultures too. In 1824, five years after Raffles landed, there were 15 Arabs residing in Singapore most of whom were from the Hadramud region in Yemen. It is estimated that over 90% of Singaporean Arabs can trace their ancestry to this region.
I'm Abdul Kadir Omar Ledrus, and I'm currently a researcher of ASTAR Singapore. We were working on some cancer research projects, and I'm a Singaporean Arab. So while my father was a migrant from Hadramaut in Yemen, my mom is actually a fifth generation descendant from Said Omar Al Junaid, who came during the time of Raffles. All right, welcome to the Aljunied family function. So today we are at a combined open house of seven different families gathered in one location. There's about 250 invitees today. And it's almost like a wedding, but it's not. So growing up in a household that's just next to my grandparents' place, I grew up witnessing all kinds of events. We used to host delegates, religious scholars from Middle East, and you know, when I was younger, I, thought, I just thought it was a lot of fun, you know? But actually, it was very impactful. These were all the moments when the community got together. My first cousins on my mom's side, all, it's 11 of us all together and all of us are here now. To the next generation of the Aljunied family, my nephew and nieces. Coming from the Aljunied family, which has a long history in Singapore, my grandfather in particular, Sayyid Abdullah bin Harun al Junaid, was a very inspirational figure to me growing up. He was also the president of the Arab Association for close to 22 years. Seeing my grandfather's activities, the tenacity and the perseverance and the outcome of his efforts was a big motivation to me and stemmed my interest to also do something for the community. About four or five years ago, I myself got more active in the Arab Association Currently, I'm the Vice President of al -Wahda. Because of modernization, there is a population of Arabs in Singapore who may have lost much of their culture because of perhaps the, the upbringing that they had, such that they feel much closer or more integrated into the Malay community or even the Chinese community as opposed to the Arab community. And one of the responsibilities of the Arab Association is actually to reach out to these people and to invite them back to learn more about their roots and realize that there's something actually unique about being an Arab in Singapore. Today, there are about 10,000 Arabs living in Singapore. Another group that arrived in Singapore at about the same time were the Armenians. In 1824, there were about 15 Armenians here. And over the years, the community never expanded beyond 100. <laughs> I'm Sandra Galliston. I'm of Armenian heritage. My great-grandfather was Armenian. My direct heritage is British, Armenian, Singaporean. The Gallistons started living in Singapore in the early 1900s. My dad was born in Singapore in 1923. When I was younger, I was absolutely not interested in heritage at all. Uh, my mom would always say, this is our tradition, this is our custom, and I was like, I had actually better things to do. It is only uh, when I turned 50, and uh, age, I think, matters. And then suddenly I was thinking what my mom used to talk about. And suddenly started getting interested in, uh, oh, where was my grandfather born? I didn't even know. So it was just uh, going back in time, trying to recall every single thing, all their, their stories. As part of her own efforts to learn, as well as to preserve the culture of Armenians in Singapore, Sandra has set up a Facebook group, Eurasians International. It's uh, impossible to create a group for the Armenians, Eurasians in Singapore because there's so few of us. We are a minority of a minority. It would have been a chat. So we created Eurasians International to bring the Armenian, Eurasians, all the lineages, all the ancestries around the world together. One of the kind of posts that we have at uh, EI is to profile Armenians or Singaporean Armenians. And the other one is to promote and support all events by uh, the Armenian Church.
culture doesn't just exist by itself. You have to make the conscious effort to keep it alive. Your traditions, uh, the way you do things, the way you socialize. It doesn't just happen. You have to create the situations. We have to investigate, we have to take the effort. Sandra is making the effort and has started another project, documenting grave sites here. My own granduncle. When uh, Emil Galliston's grave was exhumed, none of us were there. There was no photograph. There was no memory of it. Till now, I have absolutely no knowledge of it. So if the graves were not documented, everything is lost. Now he's been uh, reinterred at Mandai, but that memory of Bidadari is gone. There's no dedicated cemetery in Singapore for Armenians. But located within the grounds of the Armenian Church on Hill Street is a memorial garden. The memorial garden holds the tombstones, but not the actual graves of well-known Armenians who had lived in Singapore. My name is Sandra. I was married for more than 20 years to an Armenian, and his name was Krikor Basmajan. He was one of the founding members of the community. So today I brought flowers for my late husband. They are orchids and they were his favorite flowers. He was an ethnic Armenian, although born uh, in Cyprus. For Armenians, uh, the church is very integral to their DNA. So whenever an Armenian comes to Singapore, whether to stay or to visit, the first place that they will come and visit is the Armenian church. The Armenian church was built in 1835 with donations from the Armenian community then. It is Singapore's oldest church and the last remaining symbol of the Armenian heritage here. One of the things that he helped to do was actually to re-energize the Armenian community here. There was the church, but there was no community. So what he tried to do was slowly to build up the community, and this is what we have as part of his legacy today. So my husband, when he would come to the church every day, he would sit in this chair, and he would open the windows and look out to see if there were any visitors who visited the church. And if they looked Armenian, he would go out and speak with them to find out if they were living in Singapore. And that's how he helped to build the community here. And although he has passed on, I still stay very involved with the Armenian community here in Singapore. The Armenian community have helped to develop Singapore in its early days. And obviously their history is Singapore's history, which automatically is my history. Obviously being married to an Armenian for more than 20 years, that has helped me to understand their DNA. And I wish to bring forward my husband's legacy. So living in Singapore, my parents have brought us up um, living in a modern country but yet still having a balance of our religion as well. That's why uh, I want to do that for my children as well. So they do belly dancing, that's very important here for me because I love dancing and it's strong in our culture as well. Music is when it brings together the family because it brings together from the youngest four-year-old girl to the oldest grandmother. <laughs> Food too can bring a family together. This is the master chef of my house, my mom. She makes the delicious food that we eat. We're having hummus, which is a chickpeas blended with tahini with olive oil. 
Fasuli is a uh, fava beans with a salsa based sauce. For the kids, uh, my mom prepared a bit of a pizza and some bread. So the difference between the Arabic pizza and the normal pizza is the herbs that we use in the sauce and also for the topping, such as uh, sumak, so it's uh, Middle Eastern herbs just for add of a taste. Let's have some brunch. Yep. Lulu's husband, Muhammad, is an Arab but of mixed heritage, just like many other Arabs in Singapore. I am a third generation Arab. However, I'm also a Roja uh, because through intermarriages, um, I have the Chinese heritage, Malay heritage, and Indian heritage. My dad is Arab, however my mom, she's of mixed parentage. She's a Malay and a Chinese, so I'm a true blue Singaporean. Growing up, I went through a phase of um, searching my identity, especially during my school days. Um, I often get asked whether I'm Malay or Indian. It confuses me. <laughs> As I grew up, I participated in quite a number of activities of the Arab Association, and through their activities, I became closer to the Arab community. So through that, I identified myself as an Arab. As I understand the Arab heritage in Singapore, I feel it's very important. I hope to impart this to my kids as well. So you excited to go for the Arabic class today? Yeah. Lulu and Muhammad also want to give their children opportunities they didn't have growing up. So growing up in Singapore, we learned the Malay language because um, my parents as well were learning the language and wanted us to know the Malay language so that we can be able to socialize with friends. But for now, my, my daughter, she's learning two languages. So she's taking Malay language in school and also taking Arabic language uh, outside of school because I think it's very important that we go back to our roots and don't lose the language. Currently, Arabic is not offered in Singapore's primary schools and only about 10 to 20 percent of Singapore Arabs can speak conversational Arabic. Many young Arabs grow up not being exposed to the language. And because the best time for them to learn is at a younger age, we miss out on this opportunity greatly and later on in life, they end up actually not speaking Arabic at all. So the Arab Association of Singapore, we're in consultation with the government, possibly to explore the option of Arabic as a second language, for example, to offer to these Arab students in school. So then, that way, we hope that their native mother tongue is actually preserved. And it's not only language that the Arab Association is trying to preserve. We are teaching our youth three different types of dance, the Zafin, Shara and the Dehefe. So in Singapore, mainly we perform this dance at weddings. So this is just one way we are trying to pass on our culture and our arts to the next, the younger generation. And the association's efforts aren't just about preserving that which is uniquely Arab. Tonight we are at Jalan Besar Stadium, where Alveda FC is playing against a team of ex-international players. They call themselves Legends SG. Alveda FC cuts across the entire spectrum of the Arab community in Singapore. We really selected the cream of the crop from all of them to form this team. And this team is symbolic of Alveda itself. For the Armenians here, keeping their culture alive requires a little more effort. We're actually like a dying breed. <laughs> there's uh, no Armenian restaurant, there's no Armenian school, there's no place to learn Armenian, dance, music, so it's quite challenging. Every culture has their food, their dance, and the Armenians have their kochari. Uh, we don't know it. <laughs> so I was thinking, how sad. I don't even know my own uh, dad's uh, heritage dance. So we thought uh, we have to do something about it and try to teach it to the younger generation. 
Because if you don't do it, it will never happen. We we're very excited to learn the Armenian dance today. Okay, me too. I'm very excited too. So today I will teach you how to dance the Armenian Kochari. It was very, very difficult to get anyone to teach us in Singapore. So we have no choice but to outsource it. <laughs> Are you ready? Are you ready? Yes. One, two, three, four. So every village has their own dance. It's a community dance. In the olden days, you know, the families all get, got together. It was a very kampong style. Everybody would just dance. Everybody knew this dance from the young children right up to the elderly. I want my nephews to learn the kochari because I think that they will identify it with it more. It's a mob style. They can uh, get their friends to get involved in it. It's not so complicated. I'm feeling really, really, really happy today. And we managed to uh, get the class going. And I hope this is a starting point for us to, uh, for the Galistans to continue learning the Armenian dance. Yay! Excellent! Okay, let's go and thank her. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Today there is a wedding at the Armenian church. It is not an Armenian wedding. Uh, we allow Christian couples to get married in the church. It helps to keep the place alive. Due to the minuscule population of Singapore Armenians, there are only a handful of services throughout the year. A priest has to be specially flown in usually from Australia for the occasion. But things were not always like this. The atmosphere in the church in the past um, used to be, I think, very jovial. Uh, Armenians always used to gather for the church services. So this was a, an opportunity for the community to get together, exchange ideas, gossip. So this was like their community centre. So I expect that a lot of the activity was more on a happy vein. Helping to keep the community alive are newer members who have joined the fold. The Armenian community in Singapore now mainly comprises Armenians who actually are here in Singapore temporarily. There's a few people who have been in Singapore for more than eight years, um, and uh, they actually form the core. We're going to have inspection very soon, so we can have at least the picture. How While Sandra is on the supervisory board of the church, a group of Armenian expatriate volunteers keeps the church going. By next week, they will clean everything. One of them is Pavel Karapetian, who has been in Singapore for over 10 years. I spent here about one month and I like the place. I found Singapore very safe, very comfortable. It's a great place uh, for the family to live. So, and I decided to change my life and move to Singapore. It, it is proud for me to have such a beautiful place uh, far, far from our motherland, from Armenia, and to see that church is in, in, in uh, proper condition and uh, prosper. The time I spend at the church is not an effort, so I, I, I really do it uh, with a pleasure. And uh, I'm happy that uh, the church is preserved. Without the expat Armenian community, it would be a lot more difficult to have the type of activities that we have within the Armenian church and as well for the upkeep of the premises. That would make it more of a challenge.
one do you prefer? Lulu's cousin is having an engagement party soon and wants a dress from Lulu for the occasion. Arabs, we celebrate everything. So fashion is very important. What the bride wear is really important. And for us, it's all about glamorous. So even though it's a small function, the bride, she will look like the bride, even though she's not the bride yet. So this dress, you can wear it, uh, two looks for it. Mm -hmm. With the rope over it, it'll be Arabic, Moroccan style. Mm -hmm. You can take it out and it's just like a normal gown inside. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you can have two looks. Okay, so now you're already in the Hadrami style. Okay, this colour looks good on you. So for the Hadrami bride, how you can distinguish them is by the jewellery, which is... Uh, silver in colour. They prefer to wear the silver compared to gold jewellery. Okay, so this is a very traditional piece that you can wear. Okay, now I'll show you something modern and the face veil. This is usually worn uh, before the wedding because it's uh, better for the bride not to show her face before the actual wedding day. Okay, beautiful. The fashion may get modernised, but some practices are age-old. So every year in the Muslim calendar, there is a special day called Ashura. Now on this day, amongst many things that are encouraged for Muslims to do, is actually to go and visit orphans. A group of us, my friends, Arabs, non-Arabs, we used to go around to different orphanages in Singapore once a year to do a small celebration with the orphans. And we came across Darul Ehsan, which is the boys' orphanage of MTFA. MTFA, or the Muslim in Trust Fund Association, was founded in 1904 by a group of Arabs and non-Arabs to serve the needs of the underprivileged. Qadir is currently a board member, and recently they celebrated a milestone. For the longest time, MTFA has fulfilled most of its constitutional purposes. One of the remaining items on our constitution which we didn't fulfill was actually the provision of healthcare services for Singaporeans. So with the opening of this dialysis centre last year, we have fulfilled this pillar as well by providing this subsidised healthcare to the community and beyond just the Muslim community but also to non-Muslims. We are really happy to do this for the community in Singapore. We managed to fulfill the vision that the founders had 115 years ago of what, of what MTFA should do for the community. For Sandra Galistan, her family's contribution to Singapore is forever etched in the nation's history. The most notable Galliston is Emil Galliston, my grand-uncle. In 1903, he started work with the government service. By 1920, he was in charge of water, gas and electricity. In 1946, Emil was appointed to the Board of Trustees of the Singapore Improvement Trust. Uh, one of Emil's hobbies was cultivating orchids, and he had the largest collection in Asia. He created a hybrid in 1946. It was officially registered. And that was the Aranda Hilda Galliston. There was another Armenian who also had an interest in orchids, and Sandra aims to meet her descendant. I definitely make a conscious effort to reach out to all Armenians in Singapore because there's so much that I want to understand about my culture and my heritage. And I, just, I don't want to just read it from uh, Google. I want to actually speak to Armenians and hear their story. Linda hybrid. Right. Uh, but they've now realised that, that, that... Linda Locke is the great-grandniece of Agnes Joachim, who created the hybrid Vandermis Joachim, Singapore's national flower. 
the um, plant has changed quite a bit and there are lots of different varieties. Some beautiful blush and then that orange, right, deep orange right. centre over there. That's how you can tell the plant. Really beautiful. Do they actually move to where... Agnes was a very uh, curious woman. She had a very intelligent mind and she seemed to develop a passion for horticulture. Um, and I think she just got curious because about 1854 or so, hybrids were started to be created in the UK. And we think that that sparked her curiosity and she wanted to see if she could actually achieve a hybrid herself. It's actually recorded as such. But Agnes Joachim almost didn't get the credit for her work. There were various stories that were around announcing that it was just a natural phenomena. Just myths came up and, and stories abounded and started to take on a life of its own. So do you know where the, his plants are? In 2016, Linda had gathered the evidence and approached the National Heritage Board to set the record straight. Finally, Agnes Joachim was officially recognized as the one who bred the first Vander Miss Joachim. I was thinking, how do I go about protecting her reputation and her and, and legacy for as long as I possibly can? I've actually authored a, a children's book called Agnes and Her Amazing Orchid, and I go around talking to school children, telling Agnes's story to them. I've had quite a few saying they want to become horticulturists and botanists now, so I think she's also inspired a lot of young children to believe in their dreams and pursue their passions. Today, Agnes Joachim's headstone lies within the Armenian Church Memorial Garden. But aside from keeping alive the memories of Armenians, the church has also participated in many key events in Singapore's history. The Armenian Church was the first public building in Singapore to, ele to receive electricity, uh, the fans, the lights. This was in 1909. Well, we believe it was the first building in Singapore to receive electricity because of its close proximity to the substation. One of the recent major events is the Second World War. Um, we believe that whatever was the silver that was donated over the years in the church, we believe they were all looted during that time. It is very typical in Armenian churches for there to be a lot of silverware. And I have seen old photos where you see a lot of candle holders at the altar. Unfortunately, these were all gone. At 184 years old, the maintenance of the church has become a major operation. For example, you can see at the roof, the green plants that are growing there. Um, this is a regular occurrence and we have to remove them as soon as we can or else the roots will go in and break the cement as well as move the roof shingles. So we're getting a contractor in soon to have that removed with a large crane. But there are bigger plans being executed. At the moment, what we are trying to do is to build an, an Armenian community centre. The main reason for that is whenever we have community gatherings, we don't actually have a space for this. So we thought it would be nice to have a proper community hall. The concept of kinship or family ties in the Arab community is something that's inherent to our culture. We grew up hearing these household names like he is an Arjunet, she is an Asagaf. Such definitions of an individual by their family names. First, followed by the character or their education status. No? So we recognize people by that. Family ties are especially important with Arabs scattered across the world. 
in some communities, it may be the food that you eat or the arts that you practice. For us, all it takes for an Arab in one region to connect with an Arab in another region is to just share what information you have about each other's family. For example, if I say I'm grandson of Abdullah al-Junaid, Sayyid Abdullah al-Junaid, I can meet a stranger and he will be able to tell me how his family is connected. And instantly, any barriers of unfamiliarity doesn't exist. To ensure that family lineage is not forgotten, proper records are kept by most Arabs. Here we have an example of a family tree which dates back 1,400 years to Prophet Muhammad and his descendants all over the world. And over here, we have a local, uh, local family, one example, the Asagar family, which is from Prophet Muhammad, 39 generations down. But it's all well archived. Assalamu alaikum. Hey, alaikum assalam wa Qadir and his cousin are trying to do something similar, digitalizing the family trees of all Arabs here. I've done this for more than two decades. I've collected them using Excel spreadsheets, huge Excel spreadsheets for many families. And I've got about 20 of them so far. And with Kade coming into the picture, he would archive, he would help me archive them in, in, in a software that he's very familiar with. So using computational tools and technology, we have come up with a very interesting and effective tool actually, where you can enter person's A's name, person's B's name, hit of the enter, it tells you exactly how they are connected. And at this engagement party, two Arab families in Singapore are about to become connected. For the culture, the best place for me where I learnt it was in family functions, in weddings, in uh, events. As I grow up, these are the social activities that I look forward to because these are, these are the times when I can see the bride wearing the traditional bridal garment and the guests coming in the kaftans and the gummies because living in Singapore, your everyday wear is the casual wear. So it's very special to me to go, to go to this event because I can see and I can feel my roots wearing my traditional garment dress, listening to the Arabic music and enjoying the Arabic food. So these events is uh, good for me as well and for my children because they love seeing uh, and they love wearing first and foremost the Arabic traditional garments and they love looking at the Arabic brides because they'll ask me questions like oh what's this on the forehead or why does she cover her face so it's a good opportunity for them to learn and for me to teach and inculcate um, our cultures and traditions to them as well. For Sandra Galistan, Passing on Armenian traditions to the next generation is also important. Since the Middle Ages, the Armenians are very well known for playing chess. And most of the top chess players are Armenians. My grandnephews are very, very good at playing chess and I always joke that they must be the Armenian blood. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot of effort because the youngsters these days would prefer to do a range of different things not sit around and talk about culture. It's quite challenging to actually trying to create opportunities for them to come together, to make them understand how important it is to, to keep your family, tradition, culture, heritage, understand about your, where you came from. Alex, can you find Aminia on the map for me? Okay. There. Is it there? I don't see Armenia. Yeah, but this is Yervan. Oh, the capital okay, of that's Armenia. okay. Ah, oh, that's right. Okay. Hey guys, come, let's plan for our trip. To immerse the family in their heritage, they are planning a trip to Armenia. So, Terry and Tony and me and your mom want to go to Armenia next year. In the past, I was always under the impression <laughs> that Armenia was war torn country, conflict, and I would have always preferred a different destination. <laughs> I've come a long way from there. <laughs> and I, my family and I decided that they would like to go back to the fatherland. So since we all are not in wheelchairs and can walk 
right now. <laughs> we decided that we will do it next year. And we will start with Yerevan, the largest city. And we will make our way down to the east and end up the new Jaffna. And make that same journey that most likely our ancestors made. And there's a special place on the itinerary. In New Jaffna itself, quite close, is a little town called Gal Galstin. So there is a town that actually has our surname. So we would actually like to go to that town and see, try to investigate more about the actual original Galstons that were there. Just to be a, in a place where all our ancestors started, I think that's very important. It's like telling the younger generations we care. We made a, a trip to Armenia just to see what it was, where our families used to live. Uh, so it's all about effort. And Sandra isn't alone in making that effort. Minister, welcome to the Armenian Church here in Singapore. Today is one of the bigger events of the year at the Armenian Church. Uh, we are welcoming the Armenian Prime Minister who is having a state visit here to Singapore. He is also coming here to meet the Armenian community. Um, in addition to that, we are doing an unveiling of a sculpture of the Vanda Miss Joachim Orchid, which has been donated by a member of the Armenian community. I may not be an ethnic Armenian, but I'm happy to carry on the legacy of my late husband and also to keep the memory of the Armenian Singaporeans. Well, I hope that there will be more long-staying Armenians in Singapore, which will definitely help to revive and keep the community alive, the community spirit alive. And I hope in 184 years later, Singaporeans will know that there is a community called the Armenians. It is so important for the Armenian community to come together. We need to come together as a bigger group to understand and to learn from each other. I am quite optimistic within my family because I think the youngsters are willing to learn. And if you, you keep doing it, it will be part of their tradition. If you want it to happen, I think it will happen. For my kids, I'm trying to inculcate our traditions and customs, so I hope they love it. They'll carry it on to their kids as well. Yeah, for me, I'm very happy and proud to be a Singaporean Arab. I'm very proud of my culture, of my heritage, of my religion, and I want my children to feel the same way and pass it along to the next generation. Arabs of Singapore were the leaders in trade during our forefathers' generation. They built Singapore in many ways. And today we are not quite as successful as them. We believe, with our hearts in the right place, we can also do something significant in our generation. To contribute back to the community, to society, to, to Singapore, as the Arabs of Singapore, Jew. Armenian. We, we are, are part, part of, of the Singapore, Singapore Mosaic. mosaic.